Afghans, in fact, have made up the majority of refugees we settled in San Antonio over the last three years. Um, they receive, as refugees, they receive legal status and they get federally funded support to start a new life here in San Antonio. Um, but it is different from serving people who are, who are transiting and going somewhere else, right? When we have Afghans who are coming to San Antonio, they're coming here to start a new life and everything that implies. So just think about when you move to a new place, what do you have to do? You've got to get a house, you've got to get your kids in school, got to get a job. Um, you've got to, uh, you know, change your address and tell everybody where you're at. I mean, all everything from big to small has to happen for you, right? And that is what happens when uh, our Afghan uh, refugees come to San Antonio resettled here. Because there were so many people who were evacuated from Afghanistan, this has put a lot of strain on the system um, that exists to resettle refugees. And this in turn is required a coordinated effort between the refugee assisting organizations and our community organizations, our nonprofits, the faith community, and people who are interested in helping uh, Afghans to, to find a way to meet the needs of our newest neighbors. Since August, we've had over um, 1,200 uh, evacuees from Afghanistan who made a new home here in San Antonio. Our city response has been to host bi-weekly meetings and collaborate with many of our community partners to connect those who want to help families and agency, help the families uh, and connect them with, with the agencies who, who, can, who can provide that help. Um, Nadia will talk to you about some of the new and innovative efforts that have been created during that Afghan response. Um, and finally, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the um, long-term immigrants. So there are many efforts to meet these unique needs of our long-term immigrant neighbors. Um, immigration is a very complex area of law. Newcomers to the US often have difficulty navigating the system. So immigration status in itself can make it difficult for a person to get Texas driver's license. It can make it difficult for them to get health insurance, for them to get a job uh, in a career that they studied or worked back in their home countries. Um, Additionally, immigrants and refugees may not have enough English language skills to understand how to help their children in school or how to apply for a job or really how to make meaningful connections with their neighbors. Um, San Antonio, just as far as the numbers, we have over 160,000 residents who are not U.S. citizens. And many of them are eligible to apply for U.S. citizenship. It's estimated we have about 60,000 people here who can apply to be U.S. citizens. But they need encouragement and support through this process as it is complicated and, and somewhat daunting. Um, immigrants and refugees, uh, I think it's important that we recognize that they need to feel like they belong, that they can contribute to their communities, and that San Antonio is truly their home. So we would do well to remember that belonging begins with us. We can each be that friend who helps someone new to town get their bearings and figure out how to find happiness, whatever that looks like. Um, while it may seem that immigration is a, a hot button political issue, when you're talking to immigrant neighbors, I think um, the politics sort of falls by the waysides and you find that uh, as human beings, we all have the same needs, we have the same hopes, we have the same dreams for ourselves and for our families. And so for that reason, I, I really encourage you, um, really for your own sakes, right? For your own, for your own um, personal benefit to find a way to be involved in getting to know your newest neighbors. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Nadia to talk about um, meeting those needs. Thank you. Thank you, Tino. So um, yes, I will um, further elaborate on some of the things that Tino has talked about and uh, and then talk about some of the things that um, how we have worked to help meet some of those needs. And so I've broken um, my talk up into sort of three sections aligned to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So I'll talk about a couple of basic needs at the foundational level, and then I'll move to some psychological needs. And then uh, lastly, the self-fulfillment needs. So from a basic needs perspective, Tino just went over some of the challenges that are um, present for from legal barriers that can prohibit a lot of the um, um, attainment of some basic needs um, 
through legal status barriers that includes eligibility for publicly funded programs and obtaining identification, social security numbers, et cetera, and also access to healthcare. Um, some of the work that we've done in partnership with Metro Health, as well as with the Health Collaborative and the National Resource Center for Refugees, Immigrants, and Migrants is to provide um, access to COVID-19 vaccinations, um, throughout various uh, periods during the pandemic. Um, and parts of that included providing access to um, vaccinations to refugees when um, it was difficult for them to obtain appointments, even if they were eligible during the early phases of the vaccine rollout, um, as well as um, providing opportunities to have pop-up clinics at various events where uh, some of the refugees and immigrants that we serve were present and also providing interpreters for um, for them to understand and be able to accurately respond to questions that are asked for uh, COVID-19 vaccination screenings. Um, and, and then another basic need that I'll talk about, uh, and, and I believe this categorized in a basic need because it's really, I think, fundamental to interaction in society is language access. And that's both um, being able to receive information in language that they are most comfortable in and also having English learning opportunities. So um, first I'll speak about the Spanish speaking population, the 43% of Bear County's population speaks Spanish. I'm sure that's no surprise. And also 7% of households in Bear County have limited English proficiency. And so that can um, be very impactful. And I, I think that there may be a, a misconception that things are readily and available in Spanish. Um, but in fact, and I'm gonna pull just a few different specific examples uh, throughout this to kind of bring to light some of the some of the gaps. So uh, last year there was a JP Morgan funded study of the San Antonio small business ecosystem, just as an example. And one of the uh, an owner from a local cafe is quoted that said the Spanish speaking business owners couldn't fully take advantage of the paycheck protection program. In my case, I didn't realize there were certain things I had to manage better like my taxes. Taxes I didn't even know were due. Um, and then beyond Spanish, there's quite a diversity of language needs um, as well that are not uh, necessarily always understood or accommodated. Um, so the Afghan population, Afghan uh, speak um, either Pashto or Dari, or in some cases, both. And so one example um, that we encountered was um, the city and Bear County's Count Me In effort in collaboration with the US Census Bureau um, engaged us to help do some outreach in uh, the medical center neighborhood for census 2020 responses. And there are a huge number of Afghans that live in the medical center area. But Pashto surprisingly was not one of the 59 languages offered by the census. And so um, that was, you know, required a lot of in-person interpretation and um, sort of some unique um, outreach efforts that that weren't um, were necessary because it was not a language that was accessed um, accessible via the census. And then the last thing I'll talk about with language access is sometimes children are um, relied on to be interpreters for their families, um, which can um, disturb that parent-child relationship and can also um, ask those children to uh, need to mature more quickly. And so having interpreters available um, in settings that uh, in the diversity of languages that are available is another need. Um, I'll talk in a little bit about the Community of Welcome program, but I, I want to say that uh, one of the things in the Community of Welcome program, and I hope many of you all will consider being a part of that, um, is that we do provide interpreters for um, communities um, hoping to um, bring in and welcome our new Afghan neighbors. So, uh, and then and then another thing I'll say on language access is I think that a lot of it is also about advocacy and helping those um, those voices be heard of, of the people whose languages are not accessible. Um, and I feel like I'm, I, um, uh, what's the term, beat a, 
beat the drum or, or have a beat a dead horse or wh whatever that term is on always saying, well, what about Arabic? What about Pashto? What about Urdu? And I was excited that um, I was reached out to by uh, someone who's doing a, uh, some work with the San Antonio's small business uh, development office saying, we know that there's small business owners that speak Arabic and Pashto, um, we would like your your help. And so uh, so I think that it's also about um, having voice and giving advocacy and helping people be aware that there are other languages that are spoken and that we need to have those needs met. Um, so the second need that I'll talk about is related to psychological needs. And so, um, and this is related to cultural integration and community inclusion. And so in, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this is a focus on relationship and the sense of belonging and love. And so one of the biggest challenges um, for communities that are undergoing um, rapid um, shifts uh, from an immigration perspective is to find collaborative ways to explore commonalities and encourage what's known as contact building between the new and existing groups. And contact building is this um, theory that was um, developed or inspired by Gordon Alport, who's an influential psychologist. And, and he talks about how it's needing to, um, how focused common goals can reduce prejudices among different groups of people and having newcomers and longer term populations um, use contact building to build those relationships and position both groups um, to have deeper interactions and relationships um, at the individual level. And so that's really the foundation of where the Afghan Community of Welcome program is, is based, which is a program that invites congregations, organizations, and uh, local employees employers to um, be welcoming communities for new Afghan neighbors. Um, and we have an application that's open right now um, and it closes this Friday and we'll have the link up um, at the end, but it encourages you all to um, apply to be a community of welcome, to be paired with new Afghan families, to host welcome dinners, participate in youth soccer leagues, um, explore San Antonio together, support in various um, needs across um, going to the library, teaching them how to use coupons at HEB, all sorts of things that are part of our daily lives that we don't necessarily, um, that we may take for granted and that are really part of that, can support that relationship building and, and integration. So I would really encourage uh, all of you to um, contact uh, me if you have any questions about that. And this is also being co-led by, uh, Interface San Antonio Alliance with Wendy Holbrook um, and with tremendous support by both Tino and Anne. Um, and then the last section is um, the self-fulfillment needs um, or self-actualization, which is really at the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is about realizing your full potential. So just a couple examples I'll give on that. Um, there are many skilled immigrants that come to this country, um, but they they don't necessarily have the means to apply those skills because either their transcripts are not recognized and they need to go through an evaluation process based on the US system, or their certifications are not recognized, or they might not have the soft skills that are necessary in American business culture because soft skills in other parts of the world are different uh, in, in the business world. Um, so a couple of examples of, of Afghan clients that have recently reached out to us that we're working with to get them into the right programs and trainings are um, uh, one uh, Afghan uh, father of a family of three, excuse me, of three children, a family of five, um, who has uh, 16 years of HVAC ex experience in Afghanistan, but he doesn't have the right certification here to recognize um, his experience. And so working with him on getting him enrolled in the right sort of credential program. And then another um, that just moved here just a couple months ago is the uh, is a woman who who has her master's in public affairs. She worked for the Afghan Ministry of Finance and she um, feels like she's she's at a dead end, like her, she's gonna be starting from nothing. And so we're working with her as well to, to see how she can apply her skills and her background and get her transcript evaluated and other sorts of things to apply those skills. And then the other piece that I'll talk about is that 
um, many immigrants come with cult what we call cultural assets. So um, they may have uh, skills in, in cooking cultural dishes or in making cultural dresses or other sorts of things. And this is also an important thing to be able to harness that innate cultural power that also can become an economic power for these immigrants. And so Culture Ingua has a program called Nourish to Flourish Culinary Entrepreneurship Incubator that helps the immigrants and refugees that come to this country utilize their um, cultural skills and cultural assets and be, create micro enterprises to support themselves and their families and contribute to the local economy and um, the cultural vibrancy of San Antonio. Uh, so now I'll hand it over to Don to, to talk a little bit more about how this looks in a, in a faith community. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, as you can see, there's lots of opportunity um, to serve refugees and immigration and all of the things that we do in our city. Um, I wanted to quickly introduce myself, Don Larson. I was a, for the last 20 years, I've been a leader in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so I've been focused internally in serving the members of our church. Um, recently in January, just took on the responsibility of being what we call a communication director. If you ask internally in the church um, what my calling is, most members of the church will say they don't understand. They don't know um, because it is, it is a little bit different in that all of my focus now is external to the church. It's how do we become a bigger part of the community? How do we serve others that are not of our faith? How do we join with others that are not of our faith? And, and that's where we found a little bit of energy in this space, in, in serving um, the biggest need. And, and so understanding that responsibility when I took on uh, this new calling was, uh, I didn't know where to start either, right? Just like other the members of the church, they had no clue what this calling was. I didn't either. Um, but what, uh, what made it meaningful for me was having the opportunity to meet folks like Tino and like Ann and like Wendy and, and Nadia and understanding, working with the uh, Interfaith Welcome Coalition and others, understanding where is the biggest need right now? What can I do today? Um, and then engaging the church or the, um, the assets the church has is, or, or the people that the church has is to solve some of the things that we could do or just be of help to somebody. And so in short, I won't spend a lot of time because I, I think there's a lot we can do in the breakout. But what I have recognized in uh, the few short months that I've been in this calling is that there is a great wellspring of beauty in San Antonio. People who want to do good just don't know how to get to it, don't know how to engage with our partners, don't know how to engage with an NGO or with the city, or basically just get involved. And so the opportunity for us to be part of this work has led to a greater understanding of potentially the need that still exists, that's quite large, but really that, that it really is about just getting started. And so, um, as we get into the breakout and as we move forward today, I'd be happy to connect with anybody. Now, I don't have all the answers. I don't, I don't understand exactly all of the ways that our community or our faiths could join together to build this coalition of good. But I recognize that we have a unique opportunity in San Antonio in that we, we work well together. Uh, there's not a lot of division in our city and we don't want it that way, right? We, we have recognized that there's great strength in doing good, especially for others. And so um, the opportunity where we can join together as an interfaith coalition or as a interfaith groups or even down to the congregational groups in neighborhoods, how do we join together to serve each other um, across denominations, across um, faiths and across cultures? Uh, we'll continue to kind of build that thing that I think Mayor Ron was talking about this morning about being this, this great community of, uh, of love and compassion. And so uh, I'm excited about the opportunity to work with you, recognizing I don't have the answer, but I'm willing to explore get done anything and figure out a way to uh, continue to serve not only this effort, but all the efforts.